They utilised stealth, operating unseen and undetected beneath the waves until they disappeared just as silently as they had patrolled the oceans, never to be heard from again, leaving us to wonder, why did four submarines suddenly vanish during the spring months of 1968? With the exception of elite naval special forces, such as Britain's SBS or the United States Navy SEALs, submariners are arguably some of the toughest sailors to grace any nation's seaborne forces. Not only is their training more rigorous than that of the surface fleet, they must also face the prospect of being confined to cramped conditions inside a vessel which can stay submerged beneath the waves for months on end. In the early days of submarine warfare, structural and mechanical failures were commonplace, and the fear of plunging headlong into the black depths of the abyss with little hope of escape was ever present. Should anything go wrong, these sailors faced only a single fate, drowning in freezing cold waters whilst being crushed to a pulp under intense pressures, before being imprisoned forevermore in a steel tomb at the bottom of the sea. It would have taken a very particular strength of mind to accept the possibility of such a fate. By the 1960s, however, technology and improvements in submarine design had moved on considerably, and the likelihood of such failures was significantly reduced, allowing vessels to operate almost with impunity. And with this in mind, we have to ask ourselves, why then, would a groundbreaking new generation of submarine ever disappear without warning during relative peacetime. And strange as it may seem, not just one, but four submarines did exactly that in 1968, vanishing under highly mysterious circumstances, never to be heard from again. The submarines in question were the Israeli vessel INS Dakar, an experimental French sub known as the Minerve, the Soviet Union's K-129, and the United States Navy's Scorpion. Each loss occurred within a short time frame, and in some cases, within just days of one another, and in relatively close proximity, leading many people to believe in later years that something sinister was behind these disappearances. The mystery began in late January with the INS Dakar, the oldest of the four ill-fated vessels which was previously in service with the Royal Navy, under the name HMS Totem. Completed in 1943, she was one of 53 T-class submarines built by the British during the Second World War, to combat German patrols. In the post-war years, she was retasked to track Soviet submarines, and went through an extensive refit in 1951, which saw significant enhancements to her operational capabilities, by 1965, however, the Royal Navy was looking to replace its aging submarine fleet and sold the totem to Israel, where she was redesignated INS Dakar. Under the command of Major Yuakov Rahanan, INS Dakar set sail from Portsmouth, England on the 9th of January 1968, heading for the port of Haifa in Israel. The plan was for the Dakar to arrive by the 2nd of the following month but by the 15th of January, it became clear that she was making excellent time. Major Rahanan notified headquarters and requested that he be allowed instead to enter port on the 29th, three days earlier than scheduled. This was approved, and throughout the journey, 
Ranan continued to send transmissions, reporting his vessel's status and position. At some point on or after midnight on the 25th of January, the Dakar was just off the coast of Crete and heading for Cyprus when she reported encountering a storm. Nevertheless, she sent a communication stating, the Dakar is in the depths at full strength, a message that would later take on a chilling sense of irony, as from that point onward, any attempts to contact the crew were met with an eerie silence. The British Admiralty, who were tracking the vessel, sent word to the port of Hafer, stating that the Dakar's signal was lost, and a call was relayed to several naval units in the Mediterranean, requesting assistance in locating the missing submarine. Ships from Israel, Great Britain, the US, Greece, Turkey and Lebanon joined the search, combing a vast area of water, but ultimately found nothing, except for the Dakar's rear emergency buoy. This was located southeast of the island of Cyprus, and was found to have activated its automated distress beacon. Despite this, by the 29th of January, all non-Israeli units had abandoned the search. The Israelis followed suit a week later, when even they concluded that none of the 69-man crew would have survived stranded on the sea floor for so long. 32 years would pass by before the Dakar was finally located, resting on the seabed at a depth of almost 10,000 feet between the islands of Crete and Cyprus. The cause of her sinking has never been determined. And this would have remained nothing more than a little-known maritime mystery, if not for another submarine, which would also disappear without trace just two days later, whilst also on patrol in the Mediterranean. Launched in 1961, and designed for low-level reconnaissance in shallow waters, the S-647 Daphne-class Minerve was an experimental cruise missile carrying vessel, measuring in at just 58 metres. Due to her small size, she was purpose-built for long-range missions, and had a phenomenal track record for sailing long distances. By the time she was commissioned in 1964, the French Navy already had it in mind to centre her operations in the Mediterranean Sea. By June of 1967, she was stationed in the port of Toulon, and outfitted for her first set of operational cruises in that area. Command was handed over to Lieutenant André Fauve on the 26th of January 1968, and him and his crew of 50 enlisted men were ordered to take her out to sea for a routine reconnaissance patrol the following day. The 27th proved to be precarious, however, as rough storms hampered the progress of the Minerve's patrol. Soon after, the order was given to cancel the operation, and Lieutenant Fauve radioed headquarters advising that he would arrive back in port an hour later. The Minerve travelled at snorkel depth, at a steady pace of 12 knots, and was only 25 nautical miles away from port, when without warning, she vanished. When French Naval Command learned that the sub had failed to return, the order was given to launch an immediate search, but this had to be delayed until the storm had passed. Once the search got underway, it became frustratingly evident that no trace of the submarine could be found, even with assistance from British and US ships. Despite a thorough search covering a 320 mile radius, nothing was ever seen or heard of the Minerve again. No wreckage, no bodies, nothing. It seemed as if she had simply been plucked from the sea, and unfortunately, that remains the case to this day. Could it have been mere coincidence that two submarines both manned by experienced and well-trained crews, would disappear within 48 hours of one another, without explanation, especially since both had been heading for their home ports. Even more astonishing is that two more submarine disappearances were to follow within a matter of weeks. At the time of its commission in 1961, the USS Scorpion was one of the latest state-of-the-art vessels powered by the new S5W nuclear reactor engine, one of the first of its kind. She was named in honour of an earlier submarine, also called Scorpion, which was also lost under mysterious circumstances in the Pacific Ocean during World War II. 
assigned to NATO's European Command Theatre, the Scorpion participated in numerous patrol runs throughout the North Atlantic, the Caribbean and the US East Coast, and even took part in a secret mission to infiltrate Russian waters and document Soviet missile bases. Her marvellous exploits earned her and her crew many accolades over the next half decade. However, six years is a long time in submarine warfare, and by 1967, she was beginning to show signs of wear and tear. In February that year, she slipped back to her home port in Norfolk, Virginia, to get a full overhaul, but strangely, she underwent only minimal repairs to her hull and engine. She then received new orders in October to set sail for the Mediterranean Sea, to patrol waters close to where the Dakar would be lost a few months later. Now sailing under a new captain, Commander Francis Slattery, the Scorpion passed Gibraltar in February 1968, operating with the US 6th Fleet, but whilst there, she suffered a series of mechanical problems. Severe leaks broke out in both the Freon coolant system and the after escape trunk, the latter of which resulted in an electrical fire, which forced the sub to reduce its speed and sail at the safe depth of 500 feet. It was soon discovered that the Scorpion was suffering from structural malfunctions, as a result of incomplete modifications, which by May 1968 meant that she had to sail back to Norfolk for further repairs. On the 12th of May, she docked at Naval Station Rota, Spain, to drop off two crew members, before heading back out into the Atlantic three days later, providing escort to the ballistic missile sub USS John C. Calhoun, which was being tracked by Soviet submarines at the time. After safely delivering her charge to the Azores, Slattery was then ordered to make a speedy return to Norfolk on the 21st of May. Sometime after midnight on the 22nd, however, Slattery sent a message back to base, informing his superiors that he had sighted Soviet ships operating along his route and was moving to observe them. This would be the last time anyone heard from the USS Scorpion. There was no immediate concern for the first 48 hours, but after six days without word, the US Navy declared the Scorpion missing and ordered an extensive search. A number of ships from Great Britain, Spain, Greece and the US took part, some of them having also assisted in trying to locate the Dakar and the Minerve. But even with this added help, the Scorpion could not be found. On the 5th of June, the Navy declared her lost at sea and struck her name from its register of active submarines. It would not be until October 1968 that she was finally located on the sea floor, beneath 10,000 feet of water, some 500 miles southwest of the Azores. The US Navy carried out extensive analysis of the wreckage, but the cause of her sinking is still not fully understood. Despite having occurred more than half the world away, there are theories that suggest the sinking of the USS Scorpion may in fact have been linked to the disappearance nearly three months earlier of another sub, the Soviet Union's K-129. Because Soviet documents of the K-129 were misplaced or are unavailable, we do not know what her actual orders were, but we do know that she was a nuclear-powered submarine built for long-distance endurance missions with a proven track record of two 70-day long tours at sea. Completed in 1960, and carrying a crew of 83, she was outfitted with four long-range 1 megaton ballistic missiles, and could travel at speeds of 17 knots per hour submerged, a very fast speed for the time. Largely operating in the North Pacific Ocean, K-129 was one of the Soviet Navy's prized submarines, and had been ordered to patrol American naval zones around Hawaii. On the 24th of February, K-129 was ordered to commence her third tour of duty and conduct a series of diving tests. After completing these tests, she made for the open sea and sent back status updates on a regular basis. By the 26th of February, however, her routine check-ins had ceased altogether and the Soviets soon launched a massive search. Despite their attempts at secrecy, it was not long before US naval intelligence soon picked up signs of a large Soviet deployment in the region, prompting them to conduct a search of their own. Using superior sonar equipment, in August 1968, 
the US Navy located the K-129, approximately 1,500 miles northwest of Hawaii, at a depth of 4,900 feet. Her hull was shattered, and much of the debris was scattered across the ocean floor. A survey of the area also revealed her nuclear reactor had broken apart, and radioactive material had spread over a 20-mile radius. As with the other three submarines, the exact cause of the K-129 sinking remains a mystery to this day. Needless to say, such a huge and inexplicable loss of life in such a short space of time was puzzling to many people. The high seas were enjoying a period of relative peacetime. Yes, the Cold War was in full swing, and US troops were on the ground in Vietnam, but there were very few, if any, engagements between maritime forces during this time. The sinking of not just one, but four military-grade vessels, which were never under serious threat of attack, seemed highly unusual, and invited some highly unusual theories. The sea is a dark and foreboding place, and for centuries, even millennia, people have held a peculiar fascination and a natural curiosity regarding what lurks beneath the surface. History is littered with stories of giant sea monsters attacking ships and other vessels, as well as eyewitness accounts of USOs, otherwise known as unidentified submerged objects. So it comes as no surprise that these things have been thrown into the mix of possible explanations. However, there is no evidence to suggest that any of these submarines encountered anything like this, so instead, we are left to contemplate more rational theories. It is reasonable to assume that most, if not all of these vessels sank as the result of human error, that either a lapse in judgement, a mechanical or structural failure, or navigational miscalculation, caused each submarine to slip below its respective crush depth, and then sink to the sea floor. After all, Dakar was well over 20 years old, the Minerve's design was relatively untested, the Scorpion was both structurally and mechanically unstable, and the K129 was more than likely in the wrong place at the wrong time. Perhaps the loss of all four of them within the same year is nothing more than a tragic coincidence. Despite this, some theories regarding hostile action persist. Israel's diplomatic relations with her neighbours were extremely tense at the time, and outside interference could not be entirely ruled out. The Dakar sank just six months after Israel's victory over Egypt in the Six Day War. During that same conflict, Israeli fighter planes had attacked the USS Liberty, and some theorised that the US Navy had in fact sunk the Dakar in retaliation. Others believe the Soviet Union, an ally of the Arab nations defeated by Israel, may have had the vessel intercepted and the whole crew captured. Soviet submarines were known to operate in the Mediterranean, and interestingly, the Dakar may have been a specific target for the Soviets, due to her past service with the Royal Navy. Years earlier, as HMS Totem, she had carried out manoeuvres to blockade Soviet ports in the Baltic Sea, as the British attempted to counter the growing threat from the Soviet Union's submarine fleet during the Cold War. And finally, in 1970, Egyptian news media made the claim that the Dakar had actually been sunk in a depth charge attack by one of its Navy's mine trawlers, though this claim was never substantiated and was dismissed entirely by the international community. Whilst the Minerve was suspected to have disappeared due to an accident or malfunction, the same could not be said with 100% certainty for the USS Scorpion and Soviet K-129. As previously mentioned, there are theories to suggest that although the two vessels were nowhere near each other at the time of their sinking, their loss may in fact be related. In his book Scorpion Down, Ed Offley hypothesised that the Soviet flotilla the Scorpion had tailed prior to her disappearance was in fact responsible for her sinking, and that it had been given secret information detailing where she would be. Offley even pointed out that at the time there was a Soviet spy ring within the US Navy, led by the turncoat spy John Anthony Walker, who informed the KGB and the Soviet Navy that the Scorpion would be making her way home via the Azores. Using this information, the flotilla is believed to have engaged and destroyed the sub. Another book, All Hands Down by Kenneth Sewell, 
also suggested that the US Navy and the Soviet fleet learned of this fact shortly afterwards and then agreed to cover it up in an attempt to keep tensions from exploding into a full-blown confrontation. This theory therefore suggests that incidents such as this were commonplace throughout the Cold War and that numerous attacks took place on a regular basis, all of which may have been covered up to avert an all-out nuclear war. Whilst officially, Soviet Naval Command stated that it never once issued a fire order to any of its operational submarines, many claims by both US and British Royal Navy commanders suggest otherwise, and theories abound that the USS Scorpion may in fact have been a trade-off casualty for the sinking of the K-129 a few months earlier. Many high-level Soviet commanders believed that another US sub had encountered and engaged the K-129 in the waters off Hawaii. This is not beyond all possibility, for American submarines were known to trail their Soviet counterparts in that area and at dangerously close distances. The theory of an engagement, or even a collision, gained traction when another American sub, the USS Swordfish, sailed into a Japanese port for repairs to a damaged periscope. American commanders were quick to state that the sub had allegedly run into an iceberg in the North Pacific, but Soviet command noted she arrived in Japanese waters just days after the K-129 had been reported missing. Interestingly, the US Navy located the K-129 and in 1975 began a salvaging operation, which was codenamed Project Azorian. We hardly need to point out that the Azores was the Scorpion's last known location. So what are we to make of all this? Did these submarines suffer at the hands of incompetence, either on the high seas or whilst back in port? Were they lost to hostile engagement? Or did they meet some other fate that sits beyond the realm of our understanding? Unfortunately, there is no precise narrative, no clear indication of exactly what occurred. People will inevitably make up their own minds and believe whatever they want to believe. In the end, the question over why so many experienced young men needlessly lost their lives is as tragic as it is mysterious, especially for the families involved, the families that never received the answers they so desperately needed. So many people were affected by these tragedies and we can only hope they find solace in the knowledge that their loved ones died in the service of protecting their homelands. May they rest in peace.